came out, uh, there are also uh, some other uh, provisions uh, which I'd like uh, to, uh, to um, explain a bit. Uh, there is, of course, uh, uh, the idea also that uh, model treaty provisions and recommendations regarding the design of domestic rules to prevent the granting of treaty benefits in appropriate circumstances uh, that's also on the table. I'm, I'm not going uh, to deal with uh, these recommendations so much because I want to focus on the tax treaty as such. In respect of the tax treaty, one of the ideas which is on the table is uh, that uh, the, 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 the heading of the tax treaty and the preamble should already make clear uh, that the idea when a tax treaty is conclude, concluded of course, still to avoid double taxation, so the OECD has not changed that yet, uh, but uh, is, uh, also not uh, to create opportunities uh, for double non-taxation, and that should uh, be made explicit now uh, in the preamble. And of course, that's also, I think, a very interesting question, whether this will have relevance. Of course, uh, Practitioners who apply the treaty, they don't look that much at the preamble. Judges might look more often at the preamble when they interpret the treaty. Uh, but still, I have my doubts if uh, this change in the preamble will really have a lot of relevance. Because if you look at specific treaty provisions, uh, then it's still the case uh, that uh, uh, some treaty provisions, the application of some treaty provisions, could still lead to double non-taxation. That's maybe not so much relevant in an Indian context, since you prefer the, the credit method in your treaties, uh, but for those countries, and that's true for many European countries, which have the exemption method in their treaties or for their residents, well, double non-taxation can always be the result of the application of a treaty, as long as there is no subject to tax clause, because if taxation rights are allocated to one country, the other country is excluded from levying any taxes under the treaty, and that country which has the taxation right under the treaty does not exercise the taxation right, well, then the obvious result is double non-taxation. So therefore, whenever a treaty uh, has uh, the exemption method, it's kind of obvious uh, that uh, the treaty can also create opportunities uh, for double non-taxation. And there are also some other maybe uh, examples of minor relevance, but which might also be relevant for your treaties. Uh, if you just think about the student article, uh, where also double non-taxation uh, could be the result. So therefore, I have my doubts whether it really has a lot of legal relevance if in the preamble a statement is made that double non-taxation is not the intention. And then, when we look into the treaty further, we find a lot of provisions uh, which uh, state uh, the opposite at the end of the day and which uh, could lead to double non-taxation. So therefore, my personal impression is, or my prediction is, uh, that uh, this uh, uh, changed preamble might not have uh, too much relevance. Yeah, uh, what I'd like to deal with in the next uh, few minutes are those specific provisions of the treaty, which have been suggested now, they are not in the treaty yet, which uh, deal with anti-abuse situations and with uh, treaty shopping. And here uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, provisions. The most prominent one is uh, an LOB clause. And I understand that a lot of Indian treaties uh, have an LOB clause already. Of course, uh, it's also fair to say that those LOB clauses had originally been developed by the US treaties, and they are part of the US model convention. And what the OECD has done, more or less, is uh, copying uh, the, again, as uh, I've mentioned before with the hybrid mismatch rule, copying the US uh, provisions from the US model convention to the OECD model convention. So therefore we have now in the proposal six uh, different paragraphs uh, which uh, would uh, lead, uh, uh, which should constitute an LOB clause. Uh, so therefore uh, the idea is if um, uh, that uh, to make sure uh, that only uh, taxable entities uh, are entitled to the treaty benefits uh, which should be entitled and that it's not uh, possible uh, to uh, uh, circumvent uh, the uh, residence principle of uh, the treaty. So uh, it's interesting the scope of uh, these LOB clauses are similar as the US treaty don't cover 
uh, the old treaty as such, but covers most important provisions, namely the so-called distributive rules or the allocation rules, and also the method of article, but for example, not Article 25, uh, the mutual agreement uh, procedure article, which should not be covered uh, by the LOB clause, which is understandable, of course, because, uh, uh, and, and I think also, uh, uh, very positive because now, since we have all these changes of the OECD model conventions, or if we have all these changes, then the OECD model convention will become extremely complex at the end of the day, yeah? which is uh, uh, good news and bad news at the same time, yeah? uh, because I think nobody who is in the profession will be out of work. Uh, so there will be a lot of work uh, to do, uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, uh, it, it will require a lot of specialization uh, to apply uh, those uh, treaties at the end of the day. And coming back to, uh, to the topic here, to the issue here, Article 25, mutual agreements, we will have uh, hundreds and uh, thousands of conflicts, of disputes, how these rules uh, have to be applied at the end of the day. So therefore it's really necessary uh, that we have the mutual agreement procedure and this mutual agreement procedure is also supplemented by arbitration clause. I know this is an, an issue uh, where India is not one of the front runners uh, yet uh, uh, in that respect and uh, I think this is something uh, the Indian government should consider to change the policy in that respect. I know it's a difficult issue, has a lot to do with sovereignty issues and so on, uh, but still, at the end of the day, if you want to uh, make uh, those treaties effective, then you need also an effective arbitration clause uh, there. Yeah, but at least mutual agreement uh, procedures should work, so therefore it's necessary uh, to get access uh, to, a mutual, uh, to the mutual agreement uh, procedure so that conflicts, uh, that uh, competent authorities at least could try to solve uh, the conflicts. The, the structure of the LOB clause, and I won't go in, into the details, is very similar to the one of the US. Uh, so you have uh, the treaty in general is applicable on individuals, so individuals are not uh, concerned uh, by the LOB clause. However, it's uh, still an open issue the OECD has to solve how to deal with such strange animals as pension funds or collective investment vehicles. Uh, in some treaties uh, they are deemed to be individuals. Uh, that could be uh, one solution, but here the OECD is still working how to deal with uh, those uh, uh, entities. Uh, Qualified persons under the LOB clause, so those who should get uh, uh, the benefits in general, are the state and also state-owned companies, according to the new version which came out just uh, two or three weeks ago, which is interesting. So the OECD uh, uh, pr uh, prefers uh, or gives priority, gives preference uh, to government-owned entities than to private-owned entities, which on the one hand, of course, is understandable, uh, uh, from a government's perspective, but uh, in particular in a European Union uh, perspective, in a European Union context, uh, this uh, raises interesting issues because in the European Union we have state aid uh, provisions and therefore it's not that easy uh, to give preferential treatment to one type of entity against uh, the other, another type of entity and to give preferential treatment, preferential treatment to government-owned entities. So I think this is still a, de a debate uh, we have uh, to have. Yeah, uh, then we have uh, provisions with uh, companies uh, which has uh, which have shares which are publicly traded, they should be in general safe, charitable organizations uh, should be uh, safe, uh, and then there is a special test, an ownership test, a combined test, ownership base erosion, very similar to the one uh, we have in the US, uh, in the US treaties. There is also a provision for active conduct of a business, so if you have an active conduct of a business, then you should also be safe. However, all these uh, terms uh, will come up to interpretation and we will have a lot of case law at the end of the day uh, what an active conduct of a business means. Yeah? So therefore, in theory, it looks nice uh, that active conduct of a business is safe, but uh, once you look into the details and once you look into real life situations, then I think life will become uh, complicated. <coughs> there might also be a derivative benefits test, which is uh, quite uh, important in the European context. The US has concluded some treaties with some European countries in that respect, because again, in Europe we have uh, the freedoms uh, 
uh, we have a common market within Europe, so therefore it's not that simple uh, to grant benefits only to entities in one country and uh, not to entities of other countries or if the shareholders are in other countries. So that has a lot to do with the European Union context. And there is also a kind of a grace clause or a, discret, a clause which provides for discretionary relief under the DLOP clause. So therefore, uh, the, uh, the OECD, as the US does, obviously acknowledges that there are situations uh, which are covered under the LOB clause, which should not be covered under the LOB clause, yeah? So, because otherwise you wouldn't need such a grace clause. So therefore, uh, there is an opportunity for the competent authorities uh, to uh, grant a treaty relief in a situation uh, which would be covered under the LOB, but where it is clear that the principal purpose of the taxpayer was not to circumvent uh, the situation. And that leads me already to the, uh, to the next uh, proposal, because there is also, next to the LOB clause, a kind of GAR in the treaty, uh, which had been proposed. So in spring it was Article X, Paragraph 6, now in the September draft it's in Article, 6, Article X, Paragraph 7, and it's a GAR very similar to the one we have in some countries, and of course, uh, uh, you are the experts on that because in your country you have had a very lively uh, discussion on the introduction of GARs. Uh, so I'm sure all of you have uh, dealt uh, uh, with uh, GARs in the last month and years uh, when you had this uh, political uh, debate uh, in, in your country. Uh, probably we will have such a GAR also on the treaty level. And uh, you have the wording here of the GAR which had been uh, proposed. Um, there had also been some changes, yeah, so for example, here in that draft you see, you see uh, that the GAR is now also applicable on items of capital, not only items of income. In spring, in the spring draft it was different, it was also, uh, was only applicable on item, now it's for example uh, on item of income, now it's applicable also on capital, so there are some uh, changes here. However, uh, the yeah, the, the basic idea, and I don't, uh, for reasons of time, I don't want to go into uh, the details, uh, but uh, this uh, GAR is only applicable, shall only be applicable on the uh, treaty level, uh, so not on benefits under domestic law, just on benefits under the treaties, and under, to be precise, under the specific treaty uh, where it uh, has been included. It's an open question whether this GAR will also be applicable on definitions as, as such. I think the answer will depend because sometimes the definitions, of course, become part of the rule and have a legal consequence. They will be part of the allocation rule, of the method article. We don't know whether they, the GAR will also be applicable on the non-discrimination clause on the mutual agreement procedure clause, which is also an interesting issue if uh, the government can say, well, I'm not going to initiate a mutual agreement because I think this is a case of abuse. We don't know yet. Exchange of information, we don't know either. I jump a bit. Yeah, the, the, the GAR consists here as most GARs, and it's uh, mainly taken from the, uh, from the UK example, uh, it contains of a subjective element and a kind of objective element. Uh, this, the subjective element is the so-called uh, principal purpose test. So therefore, quite often, the OECD now refers to the GAR as the uh, PPT, the principal purpose uh, test provision. Yeah, so that's how the OECD uh, prefers uh, to call that. And, uh, and also, the OECD uh, emphasizes uh, that uh, uh, the scope of this provision seems to be kind of objective because uh, you have to look at all the uh, facts and circumstances. At the end of the day, uh, if, whenever you ask what the purpose of a transaction was, uh, then you ask for the intention of the taxpayer. So therefore, in my view, it's pretty clear uh, that uh, this clause has a subjective element and at the end of the day, uh, the tax administration applying such a provision wants to know what was the subjective intention of the uh, taxpayer. Uh, which is always difficult. Whenever you have a provision which refers uh, and which relies on the subjective, subjective intention, that's difficult, uh, it's close to impossible to find out because 
uh, no tax authority, nobody else uh, can really tell you what you have in your mind, what you have in your heart, what are your motives are, and quite often you have more than one motive at the end of the day. Uh, so um, uh, it's very difficult, but I think what's, what the tricky issue is here that the provision also provides for procedural rules, because the provision says uh, that the tax administration doesn't have to provide evidence that the principal or one of the principal pur purposes of the taxpayer is uh, uh, the, uh, the, the circumvention of the, of the rule, more or less, in other words. Yeah? It's uh, enough uh, that it is reasonable to conclude. Yeah? So therefore, there's a kind of shift of burden. Yeah? It's not evidence uh, uh, which is required. It's, it just has to be reasonable to conclude for the tax authorities that, and this is now the substantive criteria, that one of the principal purposes of, uh, the, uh, of the transaction uh, was uh, to, um, uh, to circumvent, in other words, uh, to get a benefit uh, here under the provision. Yeah? Which is, I think, quite difficult uh, to assess at the end of the day, yeah? because, as I've said, to find out what the purpose is is already difficult. Uh, the, but however, the provision also requires that you distinguish between a uh, principal purpose, previously it was main purpose, now it's principal purpose, and maybe a side purpose, yeah? And then obviously you can have more than one principal purposes because it's, it's necessary or it's sufficient that one of the principal purposes of uh, the provisions uh, of, of, the, of, uh, of the transaction is uh, uh, trying to get that benefit, yeah? So uh, if you really take that provision serious, then I think it will be very, very difficult uh, to apply at uh, the end of the day. Yeah, and uh, then of course, uh, the, uh, as most GARs, this provision also makes reference to the object and purpose of uh, the provision, so the GAR is not applicable, it's phrased as a kind of exception. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the GAR is not applicable, or the principal purpose test is not applicable, if uh, uh, the transaction of the taxpayer is in line with the object and purpose of the treaty provision. So therefore there's reference to the object and purpose of the treaty provision. However, again, a procedural requirement, only if it is established that this is in line with the object and purpose of the treaty provision. So again, a shift of burden of proof, uh, the exception here we need evidence, it has to be established. So therefore, uh, I think the rule is not really balanced. Uh, there is a certain bias uh, towards uh, the governments, which is uh, not surprising uh, once you consider that it's government representatives sitting together in the OECD and uh, drafting uh, those uh, rules at the end of the day. It's also from a, from a methodological point of view, I think, quite problematic uh, because uh, the rule says that the exception is you have to look at the object and purpose of the treaty. However, when we interpret a treaty, like any other provision, of course, we start with the letters of the law, uh, but uh, we always look at the object and purpose. Otherwise, we would never find out what the content of a rule is. So therefore, we have to look at the object and purpose always. So therefore, the question is, why is it necessary uh, to emphasize that? Do we have to look at the object and purpose of a, tool, of a rule only in an abuse situation? Is that the idea? And uh, just at the mere letters of the law in other situations? Again, I don't have the answers, I just have uh, questions, but I think there are some uh, problems in that uh, rule we are going to deal with, or we should deal with in the next month. What is the legal consequence of this uh, treaty guard? It is uh, that uh, the, uh, the rule which is obviously circumvented, or the benefit the taxpayer wanted to, to achieve, uh, shall not be granted. However, the rule does not say what uh, should happen instead? What is the legal consequence instead? It only tells us uh, that the benefit shall not be granted. Yeah? So therefore, just think sometimes uh, you have the question, is Article 10 or 11 applicable? Is the dividend article appli applicable or the interest article applicable? Yeah? What happens, for example, if uh, uh, the result of the application of the rule is that Article 11 is uh, not applicable and therefore the withholding tax reduction of Article 11 uh, may not uh, be applied? Does that mean that no treaty rule is applicable? Is that the idea? It's drafted like that, but I don't think or I don't hope that this was the idea. Yeah? 
but uh, can we still apply then Article 10, for example, if, uh, if the, the real rule which should be applicable is Article 10, the dividend article, and can we apply uh, the withholding tax limitation there? These are also open issues, and there are some others, so if we have time in the discussion afterwards, I'm happy uh, to uh, discuss uh, those rules. So you've realized already that I'm personally very skeptical uh, about uh, this uh, treaty guard. I'm also skeptical about the LOB as such, but at least uh, the LOB to a certain extent is kind of precise. It will be a kind of science in its own, uh, but uh, at least it's possible to look at the requirements there and try to apply them. Whereas the treaty guard, this principal purpose test, uh, leads to a lot of uncertainty at the end of the day. And I think what is true for many jurisdictions, I think is also true for this treaty guard. Uh, I just uh, would cite uh, a, a prominent uh, German uh, scholar who was uh, the, uh, the, the president of the presiding uh, chamber of the German Federal Tax Court. Uh, and he once said uh, that only a bad lawyer, only a bad uh, judge needs a guard. Because good judges, they just interpret the law uh, only if they are not good enough uh, to achieve the result they want to achieve, they need a car for that. So therefore, I think uh, there is a lot of truth uh, in, in, in that statement. Uh, and uh, therefore, bad judges, bad uh, lawyers uh, will have a pretext also to arrive at their result they always wanted to arrive uh, once they have a car. And uh, if there is no car, it's much more difficult for them because then they really have to uh, to interpret the law as it is and uh, come up with reasoning uh, yeah. why uh, they want to uh, achieve a certain result or why not. Yeah. Yeah. However, it's not really, and this is maybe good news, it's not really um, uh, 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 very likely that this GAR will become part of most treaties. I think it will become part of the OECD model convention, but uh, the US had always been very skeptical about those GARs. They liked the DLOBs, they have developed them, of course, uh, but uh, they don't like uh, the treaty guards. And it had been some years ago, for example, that the US Senate has uh, rejected the approval of the treaty between the US and Italy because it contains such a guard. Yeah? So they sent the whole treaty back and, uh, and asked the negotiators to renegotiate the treaty. So uh, I wonder if they really have uh, changed their position in the meantime. And uh, so, uh, and since the U.S. of course is a very uh, has a lot of influence in the whole process, I'm not sure if uh, if uh, having such a car will be the general standard. And if you read the papers uh, which came out uh, a few weeks ago in mid of September by the OECD, you read already rather soft language. So there should be something done against treaty abuse, either a LOB or a car. And uh, there should be kind of minimum standards. So I think uh, uh, we are already going to be prepared uh, uh, to a situation that uh, probably many countries will not have both of them, which in my view is a, a good uh, development. I think it's not that good that uh, the US is able uh, to impose always their ideas on all the others. I'm not, uh, uh, not anti-American, but I think uh, uh, that we have to be very careful in respect of the whole uh, PEPS uh, process here, because PEPS is not uh, uh, really, I think, about making the world better. It's, uh, uh, it's helping some big countries uh, to influence the world in their way uh, they like to have it. Uh, I think we shouldn't be naive in that respect. And uh, I think the only hope in respect of the GAR is that the US doesn't like it at the end of the day, uh, to be realistic. Since I'm, I'm running out of time, uh, just a few words about uh, some other measures which have been discussed uh, or which are on the agenda, so that we have also some time for, for a Q&A later on and uh, to hear your, uh, your, your ideas. Uh, I think it's also interesting to see uh, that the OECD has already a bit step back. So they had been quite ambitious uh, a year ago, put a lot of ideas on the table, on the agenda, and some of, it, some of these ideas they have already accepted or acknowledged uh, that uh, there will be no changes. An example for that is the issue of splitting up of contracts. Uh, this has a lot to do with Article 5, Paragraph 3 of the OECD Model Convention and the equivalent provision of the UN a Model Convention, uh, where we have uh, construction sites uh, as permanent establishments. 
And of course, the OECD realized uh, that uh, there is a lot of tax planning around, and in particular, groups of companies, sometimes they avoid having a permanent establishment, a construction site is a permanent establishment in some countries uh, by uh, splitting the contracts between different companies within the group. So therefore, if you have 12 months under the OECD or six months under the UN model convention or under other uh, uh, conventions, uh, well, it's uh, quite simple uh, to uh, split uh, the responsibilities within a group and therefore one company or each of the companies is uh, uh, present there less than whatever the period is. Yeah, so of course this is uh, not such sophisticated tax planning and the OECD of course is aware uh, that, uh, that some countries, uh, uh, that some companies make use of uh, this. So there was the idea to have a specific provision for groups of companies in that respect. Here the OECD more or less gave up already and said, well, they are not going to change uh, the OECD uh, model convention. They say it's enough to have some statements in the OECD commentaries and uh, they hope uh, that uh, uh, judges uh, then finally will look at that situation from a more substance versus form or substance over form approach. So therefore the OECD model convention obviously will not be changed. Same is true for hiring out of labor. That's an issue under Article 15, Paragraph 2, where we often see in practice the question is who is the employer at the end of the day? Uh, if you have different employers, economic employer, legal employer, and so on. Uh, so there are also a lot of, of difficult issues and a lot of tax planning around. Uh, however, the OECD has already uh, more or less uh, said that uh, they will not uh, change Article 15, Paragraph 2. Uh, they will just uh, might make some changes in the OECD uh, commentaries. Then there are some other issues about uh, uh, transactions which are intended to avoid dividend characterizations. The OECD uh, has uh, uh, um, considered to change the definition of dividend and interest in order to draw the borderline between, in particular, between interest, uh, between dividends and capital gains differently. Uh, however, this is uh, still an open issue. Uh, the, the OECD has said that they will do further work uh, under the BEPS project and, uh, uh, and then at the end of the day they will see if they will uh, suggest to change uh, those uh, definitions. There, has, there is already the draft proposal a concrete suggestion uh, to change Article 10, Paragraph 2, uh, Subparagraph A. You know, this is the, uh, the uh, provision for uh, intercompany dividends. We have in general, under the OECD model convention, 15% uh, withholding tax limitation for dividends and we have reduced rates uh, for uh, parent subsidiary situations if there is a, uh, at least 25% particip participation of the parent company. Uh, then it's reduced to 5% and there are some treaties around, in particular US treaties, where it's even reduced to 0%. Uh, percent. Um, and uh, here uh, the, uh, the, the OECD uh, wants to make the OECD model convention fit against uh, dividend stripping uh, structures, so therefore this uh, reduced withholding tax rate shall only be applicable if uh, the shares are hold for a 36 five uh, days holding period. So therefore uh, they want to uh, make sure that you don't get uh, this uh, reduced rate if you hold the shares just for a few days when the dividend is distributed and then sell them again. So those uh, structures uh, should be uh, covered. Yeah. Uh, then Article 13, Paragraph 4, which is uh, the uh, provision for real estate companies, shall also be uh, changed a bit. Uh, so, so far this provision is only applicable for shares uh, in a company uh, which has more than 50% of its assets in immovable property situated in a country. It's a kind, it's a, it's for a long time been a kind of look-through provision, not in the technical sense, but that's the idea behind. So therefore, if you sell not your immovable property, but if you put it in a company and then sell the shares of the company, uh, then uh, the same state should have the taxation right, which has uh, the taxation right for the immovable property. That's the basic idea under Article 13, Paragraph 4. And the scope of this provision uh, shall be uh, extended uh, now. Uh, so shares and comparable interests, such as interests in a partnership or trust, should also be covered. 
So the term trust, uh, which uh, will become a legal term under the OECD model convention, which is also interesting because you have very different concepts of trust around in the world and which uh, trust is really meant.